Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Lord's Day. Uh, trust that you're having a good day already in the Lord today. And um, just praise God that uh, even though we are unable to meet physically today in this room, that we can uh, gather together uh, online. And uh, we thank the Lord for just the, uh, the privilege of uh, living in the time that we do, uh, where we have the technology that we have to be able to communicate uh, God's word. And so uh, I just praise, praise God for that. But as you guys are all aware, the elders and I, we, uh, we, we decided not to hold physical services uh, today, simply as a precaution. Um, uh, as I said, back in January, uh, when we had to take two weeks off, uh, the last time that this, that this happened, that it was going to happen again. Um, uh, we are trying our best during this pandemic to hold physical services. We have, we have made physical services and holding regular physical services uh, uh, as the priority during this time. That's the reason why we've done things like outdoor services when we, when we uh, had the weather with us and uh, drive-in services, these kind of things. But, uh, but just out of love and care for our church family and really the surrounding communities around us, uh, sometimes we need to go online. And uh, that's, that's what we got to do today. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little disappointing, but, but uh, Hey, praise God for, for uh, as I said before, for the technology. And praise God that uh, we will be uh, meeting here again in this room next week, Lord willing. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll trust him for that. But I just want to encourage you that uh, since today we are going to be missing uh, the physical fellowship of one another being, uh, being together today, to make sure to, uh, to be reaching out to each other, especially today. Um, uh, we're we're, we're going to miss each other's company today, and uh, we're going to go another week without seeing each other. Uh, well, you know, you probably see each other maybe maybe in passing, but uh, but not seeing each other together as a church family. And so I just want to, before I get into my sermon today, before I pray and read the scriptures, I just want to give you a challenge today to maybe call someone uh, that, uh, you know, one of your brothers or sisters here in the church, maybe somebody you haven't heard from in a while, and, uh, and just check on them. Um, Tell them that you're praying for them. Tell them that you love them, and um, you know maybe shoot them a quick text. Uh, call them, check on them. Uh, you know we can very easily we can develop kind of an out of sight, out of mind mentality, where uh, well, when we're not seeing each other all the time, that uh, we kind of forget about each other. And so don't do that with each other, okay, brothers and sisters, especially when we have to go online. Uh, check on each other, um, fellowship as much as you can, uh, even if it's a little bit on, uh, you know, just over the phone, or maybe you could do a Zoom meeting or something along those lines. Whatever you need to do, uh, be checking on somebody. So I challenge you to do that maybe after, after you get done uh, with the service today. But Lord willing, like I said, we're going to plan to meet uh, back here again, physically live in the sanctuary next Sunday. And uh, Wednesday activities will be normal uh, again this coming week, uh, as far as I know. Uh, uh, check with the leaders on that, Steve uh, with the teen club and Adam uh, for Olympians, and they can give you more information on that. But, uh, but uh, we'll look forward to that. But uh, why don't we open our time together with a word of prayer? So Let's, let's bow together. Father, uh, I thank you so much for the day that you have given to us. It is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. And God, we thank you, as I said before, for uh, uh, the means of technology, Lord, especially during this, uh, this kind of crazy time, different time uh, in uh, the life of our church. And Lord, I just pray that we would take advantage of, of, uh, of the electronics, God, during this time so that we can still... Uh, hear your word preached, God, where we can still be encouraged uh, by one another. And God, indeed, as I said before, God, that we would take advantage of, of, of other technologies, God, so that we might reach out with one another um, and reach out to one another, God, today, God, as a result of our love for each other as a church family, that, that we wouldn't develop an out-of-sight, out-of-mind mentality, but instead, God, that we, would, that we would glorify you, God, together as a church family, check on one another, love on one another, um, and God, that we would do that, especially during uh, this, this pandemic, Lord. And Lord, we pray for an ultimate end of it. Um, we pray, God, that, uh, that you would bring healing uh, to those in our midst, Lord, who, uh, who may have uh, been exposed or may have contracted the, the virus. And um, God, that you just, uh, your healing hand would be upon them and uh, that you'd be glorified in that way. But God, I just pray that you continue to just uh, protect our church family, uh, protect our surrounding communities, Lord, and uh, help us just to honor you. Uh, through this this very different time uh, in our church's life. But Lord, uh, we love you and we give you the glory for uh, all that you have for us prepared in your word today. 
We love you and we give this time to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, grab them and turn with me to uh, the book of Acts, uh, chapter 16. Book of Acts, chapter 16. We're going to continue through uh, the book. Today, we're going to be looking at verses 19 uh, to 25. 19 to 25. Acts 16, 19 to 25. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. This is God's word. So uh, moving on from where we picked up uh, last Sunday, wherein Paul cast out that demon from that slave girl, we now are seeing the consequences of uh, his actions from uh, the last text. As we read in uh, verses 19 to 24, Paul and Silas, they end up in prison as a result of, of uh, casting out this demon. It says in verse 19 that they were first dragged into the marketplace and then brought before the rulers, uh, the government officials. Now, Bear in mind uh, a few things that we learned a few weeks ago about uh, the city of Philippi in regard to their patriotism and, and really their intolerance for any kind of opposing ideas, especially, especially religious ones. They didn't want any kind of dissension at all. Uh, and any kind of deviation from the pagan worship, that was seen as basically defiance against Rome. Uh, it was seen as, uh, as an affront to them. Um, and this is why, as, as we learned, Philippi, the city of Philippi, they didn't have many Jews living there, and thus why they didn't have a synagogue there, as we saw a couple weeks ago. And, 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 and this very fact that Paul and Silas were, quote unquote, Jews, uh, was actually the first uh, condemnation that this slave owner brings as a charge against the two men, as we see in verse 20. Read, read with me again, verse 20. It says, and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, is what they said. So to be a Jew or, or any sect of Jew or Jewish, in this particular case, Christian or Christianity, this was seen as, the guy said, as a disturbance as a, as a result. All of their customs, according to verse 21, would be considered unlawful for Romans to accept or to practice. And so as a result of this disturbance, as a result of this affront, this, uh, this uh, defiance towards Rome, uh, Paul and Silas were punished and they were punished severely. It says again in verse 22 to 24, just reading with us, you know, because uh, I think it's important for us to keep reading the scriptures just so that we get it in our minds what actually happened. Verse 22, it says, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fasten their feet in the stocks. And so not fun at all, not fun at all what they had to endure. Uh, they were stripped naked, they were beaten with rods, they were thrown into prison and, and shackled all for simply preaching the gospel and really for casting out this evil demonic force from this little girl. Uh, they were thrown into prison, they were suffering because of their service for Jesus Christ and the church. However, as we're gonna see, despite their suffering, Despite all of this that, that was going on, Paul and Silas, they remained hopeful and they remained true to the mission that God had uh, set them on and called them to. And as a result, God would ultimately bless this faithfulness. And, and so while there, while, as we look at this text, while the immediate application, it, it, it should be applied to suffering amidst persecution, because that's really the immediate application. It's, it's what the immediate context is all about. The truth is, is that uh, we as Americans, really at this time anyway, we, we really don't really have to fear being stripped naked and beaten and then thrown into prison for our faith. We don't really have to fear that. Um, 
but that being said, I would just say this, is that we still, even as Americans, we still suffer as, as Christians. We still all struggle. Even though it might not be due to persecution, uh, we all get spiritually weary and beaten up and tired uh, amidst many, many sufferings and challenges. And thus there is a temptation to become, as, as Paul would write later in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, to become weary in well-doing. Um, the challenges of being a Christian, uh, even in our culture today, they, they, they can indeed lead to suffering. And, and in this suffering, we can be tempted to just simply give up and just throw in the towel on being a Christian. For instance, if, if uh, you actually live in a biblical way, as if you live as a biblical Christian, you're going to suffer by being seen probably as strange, by, by being seen as a weird or a weirdo in some way. I mean, if you take a biblical standpoint on pretty much any kind of social issue today, right? Uh, if you take a biblical standpoint on what the family looks like, or if you take a biblical standpoint on uh, infant side, killing little babies in the womb, abortion, or sexuality, or any of these kind of things, you're going to be suffering. You're going to, you're, you're, you're going to suffer by being labeled, by, by maybe being demonized unfairly. Um, uh, you, you might be ostracized from your friends and maybe even close friends and family. This is, this is suffering, Right. And thus to say that simply because uh, we, we are not being beaten and uh, thrown into jail, that American Christians do not suffer for the faith, I think that's false. Uh, we certainly do suffer. We certainly do suffer as a result of being Christians. And so I, I believe that there's a huge, huge, huge lesson in this passage, especially for, for uh, those of us who might uh, be weary, uh, we, who, those of us who might be worn out, uh, saints who might just uh, be tired who might uh, feel like giving up on the whole Christian thing. I think there's a huge lesson in it. And I believe that, that this lesson is seen not in our immediate circumstances, but throughout a lifetime of faithfulness, uh, despite our circumstances. And so the, the, the title of our sermon today is Remaining Faithful Amidst Suffering. Remaining Faithful Amidst Suffering. And as we look at the example of, of Paul and Silas, who, who were indeed suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ, I would just pray that, that as we examine this passage, that, that we would be inspired by their faithfulness in order that we might do the same, that we would continue to be faithful and remain faithful no matter what. And so jumping right into our text to point number one, we see Paul and Silas' example in number one, remaining faithful through prayer, remaining faithful through prayer. Read with me again the first part of verse 25. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. They, they were praying. And so here we find Paul and Silas no doubt in serious pain from, from being beaten with those rods, most likely really, really cold from having their clothes taken away from them and thrown into probably what would have been a very dank and dirty jail cell and, and probably really sore and unable to walk due to their ankles being, being chained up. We find them in this situation amazingly. At about midnight, after all this had gone down, we see Paul and Silas praying. It's amazing. And, and, and I think it's amazing because I dare say that if any one of us were in that same kind of situation, that at midnight, at midnight after this kind of ordeal, that the very last thing that many of us would be doing is praying. It's the very last thing. More than likely, we'd be crying. We'd be crying, trying to sleep and, and worrying about what was going to happen the next day, right? But amazingly, amazingly in this text, we find these men, even after this horrendous, horrendous ordeal, physically abused, false accusations being made against them, we find them in prison at about midnight praying to God, praying to God. It's an amazing thing. And I, thought, I find it so amazing because oftentimes, as I said before, when, when we find ourselves struggling or, or, or suffering, prayer oftentimes seems to be the very, very last thing that we do. Um, like I said a few moments ago, for, forgetting persecution just for a moment, but, but when really any kind of struggle, any kind of suffering comes into our lives, instead of praying, if we are honest with ourselves, oftentimes we find ourselves emoting, right? Maybe feeling sorry for ourselves or, or maybe overanalyzing ourselves in, in this super introspective and a lot of times negative way, you know? As I said before, you might just stay up at night worrying about everything if you're, if you're struggling, right? So the very, very last thing that we end up doing is praying, is praying. It's, it's kind of like when you're watching that action movie, right? And, and it gets to that really anxious part where they're waiting on the hero to save them. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they're waiting for the hero to defuse a bomb or something like that. And, and inevitably, inevitably, what does someone say? They say, oh, all we can do now is pray. All we can do now is pray. <laughs> I mean, 
really that ought to be that ought to be the exact opposite attitude for the christian the exact opposite attitude prayer ought to be the very very first thing that we do when we are struggling or when we are suffering as christians why why should it be the very first thing well it's because prayer the instrument of prayer is is what god utilizes to accomplish his will in our lives god is indeed sovereign as i talk about very often but but he utilizes means uh, the means that he has laid out in his word in order to bring about his ends. And those means, as we see in this particular passage, is the vehicle of prayer. I mean, for instance, a couple of weeks ago when I, when I talked about Lydia's conversion, right? Um, yes, uh, God in his sovereignty, as chapter 16 states, opened her heart. It, it, God did it. God opened her heart to believe the gospel. But this was also done in conjunction with Paul actually sharing the gospel with her. Okay, uh, this is why if, if, if uh, again, uh, Lydia wouldn't, wouldn't have been saved. She wouldn't have placed her faith in Jesus Christ if it wasn't for Paul actually sharing the gospel, actually opening his mouth and sharing the message with her. And this is why if we expect God to save souls, uh, we need to share the gospel. We need to utilize the means that God has given us in order to see the lost saved. We need to share the gospel every chance we get. Can't expect people to get saved if we don't open our mouths and share the gospel. That's what God utilizes in his sovereignty to save others. And in a very, very similar way, this is how God works in regard to prayer, in regard to our personal prayers. We cannot expect God to work until we have bowed the knee to him in prayer. God has commanded his people over and over, countless times in the scripture, over and over and over and over again to pray in scripture. I mean, in regard to our context, this includes even if we are suffering as a result of persecution, if persecution comes, we are still to pray. Jesus said it himself, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, pray for those who persecute you. So even if persecution comes, we need to be praying and praying specifically for those who are persecuting us. Um, in the very next chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus actually takes the time to instruct his disciples and us who read in how to pray exactly. I mean, this is the kind of emphasis that God the Son himself uh, places on the vehicle of prayer, that he would actually take time to teach them to pray. In regarding to just, to just uh, suffering in, in general, Paul writes in Romans 12, 12, he writes this, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And, and in fact, Paul goes even further. God's word says that we should be praying so often uh, that it should be as if we never cease to pray. We never stop praying. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says what? Pray without ceasing. Okay, don't stop praying. And so prayer, the vehicle of prayer, it's clearly something that is commanded by God, something that, 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 that ought never, ever, ever to be neglected by the Christian, including, and especially, I would argue, when we are struggling, when we are suffering for some reason. We can't neglect prayer. And so the very, very first and most important thing that we need to do when we are suffering, when we are going through any kind of hardship, is, is go to the Lord in prayer. That's what we need to do. When we don't pray, we ought not to be shocked when our circumstances don't change. I mean, we, we ought not to be shocked. If you're not praying, then don't be shocked that things aren't changing. Prayer reminds us, by the way, just in a personal way, that God is the one who is ultimately in control, that he is the one who has the power uh, to, to remove us from this kind of suffering. And more than that, that he has a purpose for it, right? God always has a purpose for, for everything that transpires, for even for our suffering. And we see the same mentality even in Jesus himself when he prayed. Remember at Gethsemane? And, and, and he goes to the Lord. Actually, this is recorded in all four gospel accounts. This should tell you how important it is. When Jesus prayed what? When he was getting ready to go to the cross. When he was, when he, when he was, when he was sweating blood because he just didn't want to do it. He's, he said, Lord, I, I, please take this cup from me. But nevertheless, what? Not as I will, but as you will, as thou will, right? And so... Getting back to our text, while, while the Bible doesn't outline this, no doubt, there, there is no doubt that in those prayers that Paul and Silas were praying there in, those, in that early morning hour, at that midnight hour, in those prayers, they were asking God to release them from prison. No doubt that was probably one of their prayers. Asking for justice to be done uh, in the situation, asking for safety for themselves and, and probably for the further spread of the gospel, that they'd be able to get out of prison and share the gospel. These were probably all things that they were praying, probably asking God to be gracious and merciful and kind to them amidst their struggles. No doubt they were asking God to remove them from this suffering. That was a fine prayer to pray. 
Even if you're going through suffering to ask God to remove you from the struggle, to ask him to remove you from suffering. No doubt that, 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 that this is what they were doing. Jesus did it, right? And, and these would, going back to, to Paul and Silas, these would be all prayers as we're going to see next Sunday that, that God would answer. Um, but even while they were praying, even while they were going to the Lord and they were begging him for deliverance, at the same time, at the very same time we read in this text, that they were expressing their trust in God in a very, very different way, namely through song, namely through song. And that leads us to point number two, remaining faithful through song, through song. Verse goes on to say, Paul and Silas were singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And so again, reminding ourselves of, of this situation, we got to remember the situation going back to the text, Paul and Silas, they were naked. They were very, very tired. Not just from, not just from it being about midnight, but physically hurting. Their bodies were physically hurting due to, due to these beatings with rods that they received. They were shackled by their ankles in a, in a dank, dirty prison cell. This is their situation. And yet, and yet here they are singing hymns to God, even amidst their suffering. It's an amazing thing. They were worshiping God with songs of praise, even amidst this just horrible, horrendous circumstances. This is what they're doing. It's amazing. And I find it amazing because again, as I said earlier, I, I, I find that when I'm struggling, when I'm suffering due to far less than what these men were going through, I find that, that like praying, that the very, very last thing that I do is want to sing. It's the very last thing I want to do, right? But, but again, as we look at the entirety of scripture, we find that God has always, 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 from the beginning of time, he has utilized music in the lives of his people to keep them faithful, to keep them focused upon him. The book of Psalms, I think, is the greatest example of this. I mean, God, you got to think about this. God actually included in the canon of his very word, in the canon of his scripture, an entire book that was meant to be sung. Every one of the Psalms that you read, all, every, all, you know, every single one of them, they were all meant to be sung. God included a song book in the Bible. That's what he did, okay? And this is because music, it, it is indeed, it's a tool that God uses in our lives that affects us and affects us deep down in our very soul and our very being. It's, a, it's, a, it's an artistic expression that, that displays really what is most important to us, what brings us the most joy, what brings us the most sorrow. Music gets at our very, very emotions and thus at its very, very nature, it, it, it can be an expression of those emotions. I mean, for instance, I mean, we have different kinds of music that express different kinds of emotions, right? I mean, for instance, when, when, when you sing the blues, when somebody says, I'm singing the blues, what are you expressing? Well, you're expressing sadness, right? You express sadness when you sing the blues. When you sing rock and roll music, right? Uh, you're expressing a whole ton of different emotions depending upon what song it is. I mean, for instance, if you are from Alabama, when uh, Skinner comes on the radio, uh, you sing it loud and you sing it proud <laughs> about your sweet home, right? And even sometimes when you're not from, from Alabama, sometimes those of us from Connecticut sing loud and proud that song. But that kind of leads to country music, right? Where, where they like to sing about their pickup trucks and their old dog and their old girlfriend and America all in the same song, right? It's what they do, right? I mean, the point is, the point is this, the point is this, is that music in general, it can be used to express a whole variety of emotions and the Psalms included. I mean, just spend a little bit of time in the book of Psalms uh, and, and, and in that book, and you're going to see uh, all the psalmists, but, and, but, but King David especially, pour out his heart to God over and over and over again of, of a variety of different things, which indeed is, was God's intention for, for music. But looking at our text today, I think it would be wise for us uh, to define exactly what a hymn is. You'll notice here that Paul and Silas were singing hymns. That's, that's the kind of music that they were singing. And so what is a hymn? What exactly is a hymn? Well, looking at the word hymn in the Greek, uh, we find that it actually comes from the Greek word hymneo. That's where we get the term hymn from, hymneo. And the term hymneo is actually very closely related to the Hebrew term hallel, which is actually where we get the term hallelujah, hallelujah, right? Which means praise to Yahweh, praise to the Lord. Um, and, and so we find that a hymn is a song that basically communicates praise that is directed to God for who he is uh, with the purpose of, of glorifying him, but, but also with the purpose of communicating the, the, the deep and glorious truths of God to those singing and that, and that those 
that those truths would affect our souls, would affect our emotions deep down. A hymn focuses on usually on the attributes of God, things like God's eternality, his, his sovereignty, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, things like his grace, his love, his mercy. A hymn a lot of times focuses on the triune nature of God, on God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. A hymn, almost always Christian hymns anyway, they praise God for the salvation that, that, that he won for us and, and one for us on the cross through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A, 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 a hymn glorifies and praises God for all of these divine attributes of, of who God is, these amazing things. And thus, a hymn, it, it's different than other Christian music. And it's different in that the focus and the purpose of the hymn is to communicate truths about God, and truths of which that are to glorify him, and at the same time invade the heart of the one singing affect the emotions of, of the one singing the hymn. And Paul actually, if you read later on in his, in his letters, he actually makes a distinction between three different kinds of Christian music in, in both Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, and Colossians 3, 16. Uh, and those three kinds of Christian music are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, all three of which ought to be sung by Christians and indeed in, in uh, corporate worship, in church worship, all three of these things. Psalms uh, being, as I said before, the actual Psalms, the actual book of Psalms. They, they are to be sung in the context of, of church worship and indeed by individual Christians. And, and in a much greater way, uh, Paul is saying that the actual Bible, the actual scriptures ought to be sung out loud with the intention that, that God would be praised by his own words, by the truth that is found uh, in his scriptures. And so Paul's focus in, in mentioning the Psalms uh, in this list of music was so that the truth of God's word that the truths that are found in the pages of scripture would always be sung by Christians, reminding them of the truths of who God is um, and uh, to the church. Spiritual songs, on the other hand, uh, which is the Greek word uh, pneumatakos odetes, uh, which simply means uh, divine or religious odes. You can almost hear the term ode there uh, in the term odetes. Um, spiritual songs, though, they, they, they're much more... Uh, generic sense okay they have a much more generic sense that, that can focus a lot more on the emotions uh, of the individual and in, in their expressions spiritual songs they they communicate more of one's feelings um uh, about god uh, the, the the ones singing they, they communicate more of their feelings about god i mean i think when i think of spiritual songs um i i of course i grew up in the 90s i grew up going to camps and all these things in the 90s i i i think of that old 90s chorus i love you lord do you remember that one uh, that's what I think of when, uh, when I think of a spiritual song. You remember how I Love You, Lord goes, right? I'll sing it for you. It, it goes, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King. In what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Right? That's, that's what I think of when I think of a spiritual song. You see how, how this kind of uh, spiritual song, it, it, it focuses more on the emotions. It focuses more on the, the feelings of the one singing. That's kind of the purpose of them. But Fortunately, today, I think that uh, the great majority of Christian music that we see out there today tends to be more on the spiritual song end of things, focusing maybe a little bit too much on emotion, a little bit too much on feeling rather than on biblical truth. I mean, to be honest with you, with a lot of modern Christian songs, um, I have a hard time distinguishing them uh, as innately Christian songs because just the feelings and the emotions are so thick. Sometimes I listen to a song and it's on the Christian radio station and I'm I'm thinking to myself, dude, are you, are you singing to Jesus or are you singing about your boyfriend? You know what I mean? That's just kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking. That's kind of editorializing. That's just my opinion today. But uh, anyways, but, but hymns, hymns, they, they, they differ from both of those because, because a hymn doesn't necessarily consist only of scripture, kind of like the Psalms, it doesn't consist just of scripture. And at the same time, it, it, it also does not only focus primarily on the, on the emotions of the one singing, nor does, it, does a hymn negate them. A hymn is kind of a combination of these things. That's why hymns are so beautiful. A hymn communicates the truths found in scripture about who God is, just like I said before, but, but, but a hymn can also express one's feelings. 
uh, one's feelings about those truths and in, in, in praise God in that praising and worship fashion. I mean, for instance, I mean, we, I think I had it on uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the music that Sarah played uh, this morning for, for, uh, for worship before we came to the sermon. It's the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. You remember that song? I mean, uh, I think that that's a perfect example of, uh, of, of what a hymn should be, right? I'll sing that for you again. I know I'm giving you, I'm serenading you during this sermon today, but, uh, but remember, holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You see, you see with that hymn, you see how there, there's, there's an element of feeling, that there's an element of, of emotion, but at the same time, there is just a ton of truth about God. I mean, early in the morning, my song shall rise to thee. I wake up in the morning. Uh, why? Why is this? Well, because the triune God, that blessed Trinity, is indeed merciful and mighty. I mean, this is a great example of what a hymn is, what a hymn should be. But anyways, going back to the text, um, I, we, we don't know exactly what hymns, what hymns uh, exactly that Paul and Silas were singing, but, but it no doubt, uh, according to what a hymn is, no doubt focused on all those things that we talked about about God and thus reminded them of the greatness of the God that they served. I mean, after all, I mean, it says that they were singing hymns to who? They were singing hymns to God, okay, to praise him. And, and these truths about God, they, they had to affect their emotions deep down, just like music does in their heart of hearts. These hymns, they, 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 they had to have helped Paul and Silas to remain faithful to God, even amidst this terrible, terrible situation that they were in. And this is what music does. This is what music does for us. Uh, as I said before, the things that we sing about, um, all, all the things that we sing about, they communicate what we love the most. They communicate what we fear the most, what we cherish the most. And, and I would just say for the Christian, whether you're suffering or, or, or not today, uh, the, the one that they love the most and the one that they cherish the most and indeed sing about the most ought to be God, okay? It ought to be about the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be singing praise for the salvation that he provided for us upon the cross, for, for his glorious resurrection. We ought to sing about his amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, right? We ought to sing how great thou art, right? I mean, amazing things. We ought to sing how, how in Christ alone my hope is found, right? And, and, and uh, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. We ought to sing these things. We ought to sing these, these truths frequently and passionately, uh, about our God and to our God for our own sakes. And, and, and indeed, I, I would even say that we should sing them loudly, loudly and proudly to God. I mean, after all, it says at the end of verse 25, what does it say? The prisoners were listening to them. The prisoners were listening to them. And we'll, we'll talk more about those prisoners uh, next week. But, but just a simple, simple uh, look at this, a simple application is that Paul and Silas, they weren't whispering when they sung, okay? They weren't just singing to themselves. Paul and Silas were singing loud, they were singing praise to God in a loud fashion. And I would just say, so should we. And so I would just say this, whether you're singing in the car or by yourself or, or in the sanctuary here with other believers, we ought to sing passionately. We ought to sing loudly in praise to our great God. And I would just say this, don't be self-conscious. Okay? Don't be self-conscious about your voice or whatever. There's no command in scripture that believers need to sing in tune. I mean, uh, Psalm 100 verse one says, what? It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't talk about, you know, whether or not it's in tune or not. I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, there, was this, there was this one old lady in the church, uh, and she just could not carry a tune. Uh, not at all. But this, this woman, she, she sang out uh, with her full, full-fledged heart. She, she sang out in praise to her Lord Jesus Christ every single Sunday. <laughs> And I still remember her to this day. And, and, and I would just pray that God would give me just, just half the passion and half of the love for Jesus Christ that this woman had. And, it, you know, in my singing, especially, despite it being out of tune, I mean, she, she just, just an amazing woman. But as it, as it relates to suffering, I would just say this, that, 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 if, you're, that if you're struggling today and you are suffering today, uh, 
as a Christian, whether, whether it's as a result of, of living the Christian life, the persecution, these kind of things, or, or perhaps you're just struggling in life in general, I would just say this is don't neglect singing today. Don't neglect singing to the Lord today. Uh, if you want to sing hymns, I mean, grab a hymnal and, uh, and just start singing through it, right? It's a great thing to be able to have a good hymnal and you see all the truths of God's word, even if you, even if you don't know all the tunes, but grab a hymnal, sing through it, maybe download some of your favorite Christian music and sing along with it. And if you're musical, maybe, maybe you sing, maybe you play an instrument, right? Pick up that instrument today uh, and, and glorify God with it today. You're going to be shocked when you do that. If you do it, you're going to be shocked at how God uses the truths in those songs, along with just the music itself to remind you of, of just the greatness of, uh, of, of your great God and encourage your heart and, and to help you to remain faithful to him, no matter what may be going on. The, the, uh, the great old theologian, uh, Johnny Cash, he, he once said, singing seems to help the troubled soul. And uh, I can tell you uh, from personal experience, it is, it is very true. It is very true. Singing does help the troubled soul. And so I would just say, don't neglect singing to your great God this week, believer, uh, especially today. Today's the Lord's Day. We can't be here together in this, in this room. I can't hear your voices. We can't hear each other sing. Uh, we're going through this collective hardship we call COVID-19. And uh, that's one of the things I miss the most about uh, when we can't meet in this room is, is, is just being able to sing. But I'd encourage you, maybe, maybe go back and rewind the video to, to the hymns at the beginning that Sarah played at the beginning and, and sing along just a couple more times today. Find a way, though, but no matter what, I would just pray that you would just sing out to God today. Sing out and praise to him. And because of those songs that you sing, that, that you would be encouraged, that you would be encouraged to remain faithful to him no matter what, no matter what you may be going through today and your struggles and your suffering, no matter what, that you would be able to sing praise to your great God. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to continue on through uh, chapter 16, and we're going to look at how God blessed uh, those prayers of Paul and Silas in, in many different miraculous ways, including with the salvation of an unsaved man uh, and his family. But um, I would just say this, brothers and sisters, um, I, I, uh, I would just say keep on staying faithful. Uh, keep on uh, persevering in the, in the faith. And I just want to leave you with, uh, with a verse that I, that I alluded to earlier in, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says this, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Stay faithful this week, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you again so much for uh, this word. I thank you so much for the example of, of Paul and Silas. And God, uh, that uh, even, even amidst their struggle and suffering, God, that they remain faithful. And they displayed that faithfulness through, through praying to you, trusting you in prayer. And God, indeed, praising you with song. Oh God, give us that today. Give us that same kind of heart and desire for you. God, and help us to utilize these means, these glorious, glorious means in order to encourage us to keep on persevering, to keep on pressing on. Lord, may we pray to you today. Pray without ceasing as we, as we uh, looked at before. Convict us, Lord, in our hearts, Lord. We, we, uh, if we are to confess to you, Lord, we are oftentimes a prayerless people. Um, and God, we see the effects of that in our lives. Lord, convict our hearts today and help us to pray to you more and more and more. Um, and Lord, uh, I, I would also say uh, that we would, uh, I would also pray, God, that we would be singing to you today, God, that we would uh, take that example of Paul and Silas and just sing out and sing loud to you, God, uh, maybe in the car ride today, or, or uh, God, maybe, as I said, maybe pick up a hymnal or maybe uh, listen to some Christian music, God, whatever, Lord, help us to, to be singing our praises uh, to you, God, and to you alone, just like Paul and, and Silas, Lord, despite what may be going on in our hearts, Lord, and may you, may you bring comfort, God. May you bring comfort to those of us, Lord, who may be struggling today, those of us who may be uh, suffering, Lord, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, God, may you be glorified through it all. And uh, Lord, I just pray for your blessing on our people. I pray, God, again, as I prayed at the beginning, for your hand of protection to be upon us. And God, that you would just be glorified in each one of us throughout the week. Convict us of sin. Grow us, Lord, and in uh, your holiness and, and in your way. And uh, God, help us uh, to, just, uh, to just honor you, Lord, I pray. We love you and uh, we commend the rest of this day to you in the matchless name of Jesus, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Bye now.